Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third and final webinar of Julie's Are You Vet Ready lecture series. Tonight, Julie's going to cover a myriad of topics, including thyroid disease, Cushing's disease, navigating cancer, biopsies, tumors, and growths. She's going to talk about diagnostic alternatives, trying too hard and not trying hard enough. We're also going to talk about euthanasia. For everyone joining us live this evening, we've prepared an exclusive announcement waiting for you at the end of the lecture. Uh, we're, we're stronger together here, so let's continue to support each other on the journeys that we're on. Without further ado, Julie, thank you for your time, and we are all so looking forward to this third and final chapter of your Vet Ready series. Thank you. Today's been an interesting day. <clears throat> Um, before I start, I just wanted to say thank you for to everybody for like hanging in there. And um, tonight we're going to talk about some pretty heavy subjects. And for anyone that doesn't know me personally, um, I really do create and sort of fly by the seat of my pants. So when I'm um, when I'm lecturing. Sometimes I'll shift gears when I'm sort of in the middle of putting a lecture together. Sometimes I shift gears. It's I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm a difficult person to sort of put in a box. And the reason that it that that is, especially when it comes to this stuff, is we have so many time constraints and so many things like we got to do it within a certain amount of time and within a certain amount of um, slides. And I have to get so much content in. And that is really, really hard for me because it's like, I, I want to support you guys like, like I would want to be supported with my animals or like I supported my clients and with my patients. And that's, that's a, that's a big commitment. I, I was really, really committed to that. So the next bunch of slides that we're going to see I wanted, I would, I would so desperately would want to put more on it, but I just, we just literally don't have time to, to put it all on it. So we're going to, once this, this lecture is finished, um, we're going to kind of go back to the table and look at stuff that, that we missed and then try to um, incorporate that into blogs and articles and, um, my AJAs and, and, and things like that, because I didn't want to just give you bits of things that aren't going to make you, to empower you as much as I really want to be able to do. All right, so let me um, share my screen and then we'll get the slides up. I Okay, you're, you're super quick tonight, but Julie, you truly go the extra mile and you insist on doing things right. Like if there's one thing I've learned from working for you, it's that doing things right trumps anything else. And I think that's super important for your integrity. And it's just why I'm so excited to, to learn from you, really. So thanks again. You're welcome. Um, well, I'm really lucky. I, I know that um, when I was seeing people come on and stuff, a couple people are on there from our customer service team, like our, our one of our new new team members, Suzanne Reed. And um, it's it's really nice to attract um, like minded people that really want to help animals and and sort of understand my my for lack of better words, analness around <laughs> doing stuff. Um, and also Stephanie, I don't know who else could work with me like you do because of because of the way I shift and, and do things. So thank you too. All right, <clears throat> um, let's get ready. So are you vet ready part three? Last week, um, we were in the skin disease and the leaky gut part and things like that. We were going to show this picture of Angel and it, it just got missed because again, we were all over the map trying to get trying to get ready. But um, I wanted to I wanted to 
show you guys, Angel, for, and, and maybe it, you know, all things, I always believe things work out for reasons. And um, maybe she's actually better in this, in this series because of this part of the series, because we're talking about chronic disease and really deep seated diseases and things that are, you know, um, really sick, sick animals. And Angel was one of them. And we, well, she came from, I think it was Mexico, um, but we wound up basically our clinic adopting her and um, she lived at the clinic and we took turns taking her home at night until um, one of my technicians, Andrea, she fell madly in love with her. So she had her for a long period of time. And then one of my interns that were, was watching her, um, her progress in her in her healing wound up giving her her forever home and adopting her and she couldn't have had a better home and they couldn't have been a, a, a that was a match made in heaven um so yeah angel angel we really she was she's a prime example of what we're going to talk about backing up and um sort of coming outside the box when it comes to diagnostics so just just remember this little girl and what she what she looked like. She was so depressed. There we had to force feed her to eat. Um, she was a really sick little girl, but turned out to be this this really funny, happy, um, uh, just an incredible dog. They all are, but she was she was special after what she went through. All right, so part three, we're going to be talking about chronic disease, cancer, and diagnostics. Uh, this is the final session of this series, but definitely not the end of your journey. Truly, it's just the beginning. Uh, what I hope that, um, that this little series uh, is going to do for you guys is just give you some confidence to, e confidence to even learn more and try more things and and um, second guess people and, you know, go with your heart. And, and it really just is a beginning part of the journey. Like I've been in it for a very, very long time. And I'm still, for those of you that don't know, I'm really still in the thick of it all with having a rescue farm. Um, when we were going over the euthanasia part of this, of these slides, one of our, our team members was really, really upset and could hardly keep helping us through this, through this. And, and I was just saying to her that, you know, it's part of having a rescue <clears throat> is dealing with this all the time is chronic disease, cancers, euthanasia, um, what diagnostics to do. So even though I don't have my vet clinic, I basically have a farm clinic because I'm I'm having to be in in the midst of choosing what the latest diagnostics, the latest drugs, the latest everything, so that I that I can make my own informed decision based on the on the on the animals on this farm. So um, again, I can't stress enough that you need a holistic veterinarian or or animal practitioner in your court either through phone, email, or in a clinic until this but until then I'm hoping that all of the information that I'm giving you will help support you uh, to work with your conventional veterinarian. So my goal for tonight is to help you understand cho your choices so that you can be prepared, present, and a big, big, big one, which was a hard one for me to get over with my own animals, is not to be afraid. I, people used to say to me all the time in my, in my clinic that I didn't seem to, I was so solid and so grounded and so present and so uh, um, focused in, in serious diseases and in serious, you know, whether it was again, chronic disease, cancer, or, or, you know, injuries, like really, really life-threatening injuries. <laughs> And I was, but I definitely wasn't like that with my own animals. And I still struggle with it. I still struggle with not going into that fear and, and, and being grounded. So it's always, every day is a beginning day for me. I, I wake up every morning and, and I, and I know I'm going to learn something completely different and understand something completely different when it comes to animal communication, 
you know, what I'm, what I'm witnessing, what I'm seeing with the animals, my choices, and did I make the best choice or did I make the list goes on. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm speaking to you from, you know, having a veterinary hospital for over 20 years and dealing with all of this stuff day to day to day to day. But I still struggle with that fear part and, um, and not the being prepared part. I'm, I'm, I, I, I think I've got that one <laughs> nailed down. Um, but the being present and not being afraid is something that I deal with probably still every day. So don't think that that's a coy thing for me to say, because it's definitely not. So there's an overarching theme when we're when we're looking at chronic disease, and that's that's about stepping outside of the box of diagnostics and look at the species oriented things that we've that have been removed, manipulated or added that could be contributing to an underlying disease. We, ne we then need to try and add what's been removed, balance what that what's been manipulated and remove what's been added. So I think what I'm trying to say here is if your dog has been diagnosed with Cushing's or it's been diagnosed with skin disease or severe allergies like, like Angel, we need to go, okay, yes, this is our diagnosis, this is the diagnosis, but that diagnosis is a name that just gives how I approach chronic disease. It's a name that gives us some tools to follow a certain path, but not to get attached to the name, the name of thyroid, Cushing's, cancer, whatever, Lyme's disease, whatever it is, it's a, it's a helpful tool to understand what's going on, but it's definitely not the be all and end of all when it comes to treating your animals and getting them rebalanced. Samuel, Samuel Hahnemann, who was a father of homeopathy, would call what I just talked about an obstacle to cure. So at our, treat, at our clinic, treatment was just one part of the overall health plan, connecting the dots to what was going on and what um, knocked the animal out of balance uh, was equally as important as, important of, as what we were going to treat them with. Um, a perfect example of this is underlying thyroid disease or any hormonal diseases, including spay and neuter and lack of sex hormones um, with, with things, we're gonna get into it, with things like allergies and stuff, um, or stress with, Cush with Cushing's, which can play a major role in the outcome of chronic disease. And we will talk about stress and Cushing's in the Cushing's part. So don't worry, we, we will go over that. Um, look at chronic disease starting with the reoccurrence of any issue. Um, and what that means, I'm just gonna go back for one, one second. What that means is that let's say you have a puppy or you have a kitten and it goes into the vet clinic and it has an ear infection. And then you deal with the ear infection, you were, go home with antibiotics and something to put it, in, in its ear and it seems to resolve and it's all hunky-dory. And then a couple months later, or even a couple of weeks later, you're back into the clinic, either with the same ear infection or something that's probably very related, which with, with skin disease, like we talked about, a hot spot or a bladder infection or anything. When you're having reoccurring um, issues, you are on the path of chronic disease. That's bas basically what it is. Chronic disease does not mean the same issue repetitively. Chronic disease means treating one disease and getting another one and then treating it and then getting another one. It can be all unrelated diseases, but there's a chronic issue underlying that's creating all of these different symptoms to appear and not just go away and have a good run for three years. All right, so thyroid disease symptoms. Um, we're gonna start with thyroid disease because it's a really, really, really common, common problem with, with dogs. Uh, it's common with cats too, but I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, but thyroid disease in dogs, the symptoms, it's, uh, thyroid's oftentimes underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Uh, these are a few of the many symptoms that aren't looked at or are not commonly linked 
to hypothyroidism. Aggression is a huge one, huge, huge one. Um, years and years and years ago, uh, when I first started with, with my vet hospital, I was a big um, supporter of, of Dr. Jean Dodds. In fact, we were the first Canadian vet hospital to use her thyroid panels and send them to California from, from Vancouver. And um, I, through her knowledge and, and connecting with her, I did a lot of work with the Akita Action Association and the Golden Retriever Association and different associations where they were clearly seeing that um, uh, aggression was being caused by hypothyroidism. So things like cruciate chairs and joint issues, abnormal nerve functions like dragging of the feet, uh, head tilting, lack of coordination. A lot of times when somebody sees this or a veterinarian sees that, the first thing they're thinking about is uh, spinal cord disease or um, uh, you know, cognitive disorders or, or things like that. There's, there's still now not a lot of the first Thing to rule out is thyroid disease, which, which in my opinion, and what we did at our clinic would have been. Uh, and the same with cruciate tears. You know, why is this four-year-old dog getting a cruciate tear? And, and a lot of times, um, animals that are having joint and cruciate problems will have an issue with their thyroid. Things like laryngeal paralysis, ophthalmic diseases, eye diseases, skin diseases, thickening of the facial skin, thinning coats, hotspots, ear infections, those are all things that are not often looked at as a possible underlying thyroid disease. But more typically, what, um, what they're looking for is lethargy, obesity, increased appetite, cold intolerance, high blood cholesterol in, in blood work, and reoccurring infections or health issues. So any one of those can lead to, uh, would, would lead us at, at my practice to, to, do a th to do some thyroid testing. So in my opinion, hypothyroidism is an easy non-invasive fix. The reason that I'm saying this is for the cost associated with the testing for a full thyroid panel should be run. Um, for the cost of this, I would, I would say that a full thyroid panel should be run. And what is included in a full thyroid panel, this is really important, because there's a lot of thyroid tests that aren't thyroid panels. They, they call them thyroid panels, but they don't have the T4AA or the T3AA. So what a panel should look like, it should have a T4, a free T4, a T3, a free T3, a CTSH, a T4AA and a T3AA. Um, these tests should be run anytime there's a chronic disease to determine if the thyroid has an underlying factor. And there's a reason for that. If your dog is showing signs of chronic illness and you only run a T4 and a TSH, which is your typical um, test that they run, if they're going to, most clinics will run just a T4 and a TSH, you run the risk of missing the true picture of their thyroid health. And that often happens when uh, they're, they're believing that your dog doesn't have your typical, like I was saying, your typical thyroid symptoms. They'll, they'll just run a T4 and a T3 and base it on that. If, you, if you're only um, basing your thyroid uh, diagnosis on a T4 and a TSH, often thyroid levels will come back low with chronic disease, which also could be considered and often considered a sick uh, thyroid which is when the, it's not a real thyroid disease, but it's when the, thy the thyroid serum levels or that hormone serum levels in the blood, blood are affected by an underlying, an underlying disease. And the examples of that would be, so if you do that and your veterinarian is looking at this piece of paper and it's saying, it's clear that the, that the, that the T4 is low, they're going to think one of two things. So the possibly going to think one of two things. One scenario could be that they look at the blood work and assume that your dog has a, has sick thyroid because they're not overweight or lethargic and they do not tip have typical hypothyroid symptoms. And thus the underlying thyroid disease gets missed. 
The second scenario that could be is that your veterinarian looks at the low thyroid and considers that it could be a thyroid problem, starts your dog on medication, and when further testing should happen to confirm this. But this, so this, what this means is that your dog will wind up going on unnecessary medications and contributing to that chronic cycle of uh, that cycle of chronic disease, which is what I talked about at the very beginning is see with me seeing a lot of animals on unnecessary drugs because the original deep testing wasn't done. So they were, they would, they would put the animals on a drug to see if it helped to rule out the diagnosis or rule, rule um, that this is the diagnosis. These tests are expensive. The tests that I that I was saying, like the full panels, they are expensive, yes, but they're non-invasive and they help rule out something that is integral for the healing of chronic diseases. Um, the upfront cost of a full set of these tests may help avoid costly visits down the road. Example, like I was saying before, cruciate injuries. So if this test is anywhere from 160 to $250, uh, that compared to a $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, $10,000 $10, cruciate surgery, especially if you have to do two, we're looking in a ten, like the $10,000 range. It's a, it's a small amount to go through to try to derail further chronic disease issues that would be caused by knowing that your dog has hypothyroidism. Um, saying all of that, in all fairness to veterinarians, I know a lot of veterinarians that would love to automatically have that in their, their, that animal's profile so that they knew that they ruled it out so that they, they weren't, it wasn't this niggling thing in the back of their heads going, oh, you know, maybe we should do a thyroid panel. I know a lot that, that would want to do it, but they don't in case it comes back negative and then they feel bad that they've asked you to spend $200 and it's, and it's, and it's negative. So they really are trying to spare, a lot of them are trying to spare you the added expense. The other reason is that a lot of veterinarians don't believe um, or aren't really up to um, the standards of, of, of endocrinology. Endocrinology is a, is a, is a, same with people. Endocrinology is a, a, it's just a real specialty in its own right. And, and it should be because it, it, it supports your whole metabolism. So if they're not up to uh, really understanding endocrinology, it's not because they don't, they don't want to do it or whatever. They're just not understanding it. Um, any breeders out there that are listening to this, you may want to include in your test a TG double, uh, double A. And that's what checks for hereditary autoimmune thyroid disease, which is, which is passed down, often passed down in genetics. So natural support for thyroid disease. I've seen many dogs with th thyroid conditions improve or rebalance themselves when a species oriented diet is incorporated adding raw glandular and organ meats to the diet. Um, Stephanie is gonna put in the, um, the chat, uh, our blog, uh, it's called Say Yes to the Bits. And that's all about feeding organs for specific problems. So in Chinese medicine, if you had issues with your eyes, they would, they would incorporate animals that you're eating anyways, whether it's a, a, a a pig or a cow or a fish or whatever, they would, they would recommend that you eat eyes. So eating the organs of whatever organ that you need to support in your body. Uh, and it's very true because, because glandulars, like desiccated glandulars, that's exactly what they're doing. A gut health protocol is put in place. A natural desiccated thyroid supplement is introduced and a homeopathic spay and neuter protocol is implemented. To do all of this, you've got to work with a professional that knows what they're doing because this is a situation where you're going to see the 
as you introduce all of this support into the dog's body and the body becomes vital and healthier, the levels of thyroid medication have to be checked to be sure that then you're not giving them too much because as your dog's thyroid becomes more balanced, it's gonna need less thyroid support. And you can't do that on your own. And uh, you, you need to have guidance with that for sure so that you're maintaining uh, regular checkups to see what their, how their thyroid is so that you're not giving them too much of the drug, too much of the synthetic drug. So oh, let me just go back to this one more time. Uh, this, this, this really does, like I said, if you have a dog that's on thyroid medication right now and you would love to be able to strengthen their body enough to be able to take them off of it, when you're doing this, it really can help. Or an animal where we really see this happening is if an animal would come into our clinic and they were on dry food, they'd never really given probiotics, and then their whole their whole health plan changes completely. Their, their thyroid really can kick in. So it's important to, um, to understand that, yes, this is absolutely doable, but you really have to pay attention. So hyperthyroid is really rare in dogs. It's much, it's very, very common in cats. Um, for our kitties, this is where I was saying how I had to shift gears. I wanted to put thyroid and kidney disease in, in this for cats because cats get the raw end of the deal a lot when it comes to lectures and stuff. And I worked with so, I can't even tell you all you cat lovers out there. I can't tell you how many hyper thyroid kidney failure cats that I worked with. I would say thousands. And there are, there's so many things that you can do and there's so many ways to tweak, tweak their medications and support them that they can have long, healthy lives. So next Wednesday, when I do my AJA, I'm going to dedicate, um, I'm going to get some slides together for all you cat lovers out there. I'm going to get some slides together for kidney disease and for hyperthyroidism. And I'm going to do a little mini lecture just on those two topics for cats um, on December 1st. So when it comes to dogs, again, the primary cause of hyperthyroidism in dogs is thyroid carcinoma, so that it's a tumor um, or cancer of the thyroid gland. And those symptoms would look like weight loss and enlargement of the thyroid gland. It's something that when your vet palpates their throat, they should be able to feel either nodules on either side of the thyroid or the thyroid being enlarged, uh, increased thirst, increased appetite, increased urination, heart murmurs, increased heart rate, congenitive heart failure, vomiting, hyper excitability. Uh, for those dogs that are, are hypothyroid and on medication, so on synthetic hormone drugs, which I also have to say is not the worst thing in the world. It's not like it's not like you're giving, when cats get uh, medication for hyperthyroidism, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy duty drug. Whereas this is, is, a, is a synthetic hormone. It's not, it's not the worst drug in the world, that's for sure. And for what it can help your dog with, um, don't be too scared of it. So, but when they're on it, and this is, goes back to that one, this one here, Please be careful because whether they're whether you're working to boost their vitality in general with food and and gut health and all that stuff, you if you see any or or you're just on straight for those of you that are out there that are just on straight medication, for, um, your dogs are just on straight medication, conventional medication. If you see any of these symptoms, it's imperative that you go back to your vet and have their blood test, have another blood test taken just of their thyroid. Because if they're, and you don't have to do the whole panel again, that's when you could just do a T4 and see if the T4 is shooting up into hyperthyroid. And that can happen whether, you know, just because that dog needs 
a smaller amount or just because you are supporting the dog and they're getting a lot stronger and they don't need that much of the synthetic um, hormone anymore. Okay, Cushing's disease and, and symptoms. Um, try to remember that your animal could display all of them or just one. So a big one is PUPD, which is polyuria, polydipsia, which is um, an increased urination and increased thirst, weight gain, muscle loss, excessive panting, sensitive to heat, so they can't, they, they're very heat intolerant, uh, hair loss, anxiety, irritability, uh, and when we, when we look at anxiety and irritability, that could be that they're, that they're you know, they, they could be pacing, they could be not sleeping on the bed anymore because they're getting too hot, um, or they're just irritable and don't want to be bugged if they're sleeping on your bed. Always hungry, um, that, like I said before, pacing, and even confusion. I've had a, a few cases where they've been old and they were diagnosed with geriatric um, vestibular and which is when they're tilting their head and going in circles, which uh, is very, um, that's, a, those, that's a disease in itself, but I've actually seen dogs almost to that point, but, but not quite in, in, that, the not, in that state and confusion. So um, geriatric cognitive disorder, and really there's been an underlying um, Cushing's problem with it and also or even thyroid so again uh, those two diseases are something that you're always wanting to look for if you're seeing any of any kind of um, any of these symptoms so diagnosing got diagnosing Cushing's it's a this is a, 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 a close close to my heart as well this disease because many conventional veterinarians, their standard standard and uh, in their toolbox, which is which is all correct, they'll do they'll do blood work, and then based on the blood work, uh, they may call for something called a low dose DEX test or an ACTH stim test, and then some of them will recommend ultrasounds, and based on that, they'll start your 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 dog on um, on the Cushing's medication. What we did in our practice when we were diagnosing Cushing's is we did a full geriatric panel and a full thyroid panel. So we wanted to rule out if it was anything else besides Cushing's. And we also wanted to make sure that even if it was Cushing's, that we were supporting the, hor the other hormones that could be affected so that they balanced out a lot easier than, than not paying attention to those underlying problems. We also did a urinalysis with something called an added UCC, which is a urine cortisol creatinine ratio test. That's a really important one. A lot of clinics won't do this. A lot of clinics don't recommend this. We've been recommending this for years and years and years and years. Um, this will determine if your animal is excreting an abnormally high amount of cortisol in their urine. But what's really important here is that this urine is collected at home first thing in the morning so that your animal's not stressed. Because the minute, it's, it's a waste of time if you try to do this at a vet hospital. Because the minute they're stressed, cortisol level is, is elevated and then it, it's not gonna be an accurate test. So again, just make sure that you're, you're, you're using a stain, like we talked about before, use a stainless steel uh, soup ladle, uh, try to go out and collect. It has to be the first thing in the morning. If you, if you get it during the day, it's not gonna be useful. You really have to, you really have to try to get the, the first urine of the morning. And then we do ultrasounds. We would do an ultrasound. And then based on those four tests above, the, the panels, the urinalysis, and the ultrasound, our team at our vet hospital would determine if Cushing syndrome was high on our list or outweighed other diseases. So if we felt like it was the it was the top of our list and definitely um, you know, we saw we saw high um, ALTs and ALPs, which are liver enzymes we would we would lean towards towards Cushing's. And because the protocol that we used for Cushing's was so gentle, 
if the animal was presenting with Cushing symptoms, not all of them, even, even a couple of them, had an elevated ALT or an ALP, which is a liver enzymes in the blood work, their UCC was high or normal, we would just start them on, on the protocol. Or if we see that the adrenal glands are um, enlarged or anything, we, we, if we saw, if we had strong symptoms and the two out of the four were very um, indicative of Cushing's disease, we would just go ahead and we would start the protocol. Um, we never ever performed an ACTH stem test because in all of our experience with animals who were borderline or very old or ill, often didn't handle this test well and were pushed over the edge into the disease. So if a dog was coming to us and they were, they just started being PUPD, they were panting, we did some blood work, they had high, high enzymes, they had, um, you know, the, the, the starting of having cortisol, high, high cortisol in their, in their urine. We, and we did an ACTH stem test. I'm telling you almost every time it would push them into flow, full blown Cushing's that there was no questions, question whether they had Cushing's or not. And it also animals that we were pretty sure had Cushing's that were really sick and really old and really compromised, they did not do well. It was very hard for us to get them back in balance after they had that test. So um, for clients that want it really were determined, remember how I said that everybody has different philosophies and we didn't judge anybody for, for what they wanted or what their, their philosophy was or what their partner wanted. Um, so a lot of people weren't prepared to change diets and, and, and do the homeopathic protocols and, and all of that. So they really wanted to use the Cushing's drug. They just wanted it ended and they just wanted it stopped or they were scared. A lot of times that fear part really kicks in. They would need to have a firm, a confirmed diagnosis. We, no one should ever start the Cushing's drug unless it has been 100% confirmed Cushing's. So we would do um, a low dose. If we had to, we would do a low dose uh, uh, a low dose DEX test. They've got some really cool blood work coming out now for horses um, for testing just just with, with just with the blood screen. So. Our clinic had an amazing success dealing with Cushing's. I think in the, I, mean, I would have to again say, we probably saw hundreds, if not that, hundreds of Cushing's animals. And out of those hundreds, we, I think I only ever had two that, that didn't uh, resolve and maintain and be comp compensate completely with, with our protocol. The two that didn't, that come to mind, one was a really rare, rare, rare um, Cushing's that had something, I don't even remember now, something to do with muscle metabolite. It was, it was extremely rare. It had to actually be diagnosed in a, in a, in a specialty clinic. And then the other one was coming from Seattle and to, to see me in Vancouver and before, and she was already diagnosed with Cushing's and she was having a hard time. They were having a very hard time regulating it with the drug, which happens a lot. So she was coming over to see me and they told her that they had, she had to be vaccinated for rabies to come over to, to Canada, which wasn't, wasn't correct, but she went ahead and did it and got, got her vaccinated for rabies and she came over and we treated her, but she died like five days later. And that was very sad. So um, the protocols that we worked with were phenomenally successful. And what I would, so what we would suggest, I would suggest for you is a homeopathic protocol, work with a homeopath who understands homeopathic remedy, the homeopathic protocols and remedies called ACTH and Quercus Robar. So make sure you remember those. 
Um, included in this protocol, we used phosphorus, natmir, and silica are the three go-to constitutional remedies. And for anyone out there that's working with a homeopath or working with a um, naturopathic veterinarian, I would be happy to share that with you guys. So you just get your veterinarian to uh, email, um, email Adored Beast or your homeopathic practitioner to email Adored Beast. And I would be really, really happy to share, share this protocol with them. The phosphorus and natmir and silica have to be prescribed based on if your dog is a really phosphorus temperament, a natmir temperament, or a silica temperament. And for everybody out there that understands homeopathy, you're gonna understand what I'm meaning by that. But I, I would be more than happy to share that information with, with your veterinarian. Uh, or your holistic veterinarian or your or your homeopath. So we would also give them liver and adrenal support. Very, 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 very important. Um, keeping the liver healthy to deal with that much ad adrenaline and, and cortisol that happens with, with uh, Cushing's disease dogs is, is vital for balancing this, this disease out. Diet, obviously, is 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 incredibly important and stress reduction connecting the dots so in the first few slides i mentioned to all you guys that um uh connecting the dots were equally as important to me as uh, in, in our clinic as actually treatment and i wanted to just share with you a cushing's disease um case of this so that you can really understand what I'm saying. So we were seeing this dog that um, that had that had unregulated Cushing's. He, he was on the drugs and was really not doing well. Like they were contemplating euthanizing euthanizing this dog. So we started working with her with uh, with the woman with uh, and, and the dog with um, our protocol, and everything was really going well. And then all of a sudden it didn't go, it wasn't going so well. We were having a really, really hard time balancing this out again. Sort of the same, similar thing started happening than when she was on the drugs. So I knew that there was something, something wrong. And so when we started talking about it, we found out that the, the, woman's uh, job required her to sometimes be at home for lengths of time and then and then leave and go to work. So sometimes she would be working for home for six months and then she would have to go to work for six months, like to an office for six months or out of town for six months. In that time, they weren't having anybody. How we figured this out was because the dog was was urinating on the floor. And I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. And, and then what we found out, she would say, yeah, I would get home from work and, and I'd have to clean up all this urine. So we were, I said to her, well, is that different? Like, is it different, is going to work different? And then I found out about the six months and six months piece. And what we put it down to is that the dog was so stressed the dog was like a really clean dog. It never, it was easy to house train. It never pooped even in the yard. It would, it would go out, try to go, <laughs> go on to neighbor's yards to poop. Didn't like pe pooping in its own yard, but it was a very clean dog. And what we decided to try just as a, just as a thing is that was this dog getting incredibly stressed because it didn't want to urinate in the house. It wound up urinating in the house because it just literally couldn't afford, couldn't hold it any longer, and it would pee in the house. So I thought to myself, I wonder how much stress he's under holding this pee, trying desperately not to pee in his house, and then peeing in his house and feeling bad that he peed in his house. So I said, before we change anything, I don't want to change the remedies. I don't want to change his diet. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything. All I want to do is I really want you to find someone to come over and let the dog out three times a day. Let's just try. And we did that and it completely balanced, totally balanced. So you could have the best treatment in the world. And if you're not connecting the dots of what is relapsing chronic disease, whether it's skin disease, thyroid disease, I don't, doesn't really matter. If something, if something's going along just great 
And then all of a sudden, it's not great anymore. You have to try and step back and go, what changed? And, or what's going to wind up happening, we could have gone, okay, well, let's do this and let's do that. And let's change this. All this amazing stuff that was working, we would have been changing it if we didn't take the time, which took about an hour and a half. We just like trying to figure it out with this woman, what this could actually be. Or let's say they weren't seeing me and they were seeing another clinic that they, the, and the drug was being given. They could change drugs when the drug was already working. They could, they could increase the drug. They could add another drug. There could be a million different things that actually makes that disease worse. So it's a, it's a biggie with anything. Um, the next thing is lots of fresh air and fans, moving air. Cushing's dogs have, um, and this is a full circle, Cushing's dog, dogs have something called air hunger and so can dogs with cancer. So they need, they have a hard time getting enough oxygen or enough air. So it's very important to keep a fan going, even if the room's warm, just to keep air moving. If they don't get enough, then what happens is they start to pant, they can't breathe, and what happens is their cortisol level goes up. So you, I, I think everyone that's listening to me is starting to connect the dots about how different things within your household can knock a chronic disease off balance. So it's not the disease that's getting worse, it's the lack of understanding of how to support the disease at home. So matching your animal's activity level with what they're physically capable of doing. This is a process and it's it's really funny because I, I often see people with animals that have um, a disease that, have, that, that decreases vitality, whether that is hypothyroidism, whether that's Cushing's, whether that's cancer, whether whatever. And they're kind of like dragging them along because they think it's so important for them to exercise. It's important for them to exercise, but you have to try very hard to go, okay, if I had heart disease or I had this or I had that, would I, would I, would I want, would I be able to, or how would I feel if someone was making me run or walk past my capacity, like with hills and things like that. The best thing to do with these animals is to start with really small, lots of them, right? Lots of little short jaunts and as their vitality improves and as they get better with the disease, then you start to increase their exercise. Because if you don't, you will create more harm than you're going to good. So you just really got to step start with baby steps when it comes to exercise with all of these, all of these chronic diseases. So this is a big one. This is a very, very, very big one. Um, and and honestly. I think I'm not kidding. I, I would say the last five years of my practice, personally, because I had, you know, three and four other vets working at my clinic and I had interns and I had um, a lot of support teams, support in my, in, my, in my clinic. I would say my personal um, practice became 50% treating cancer and working with cancer. So it's something that again, I'm and I'm I'm not I'm not an oncologist and I'm not the guru of, of working with cancer. But I can honestly say to you, it's not an instant death death sentence. And even if you've made a choice not to do chemo or radiation, it is definitely not a death sentence for you to choose not to do those things. Um, in fact, the majority of people that came to me with, with cancer, animals, dogs, cats, horses, whatever, had already made the choice that they didn't want to do chemotherapy or they had started chemotherapy or radiation and it was just derailing them. They were not, they were not doing well on it. And I did a lot of second and third um, consultations with veterinarians that were out of, out of, out of, out of province, out of the country, um, lots of different different veterinarians that I worked with 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 cancer animals. When they when the when the um, the pet parent did not want to do chemo or radiation, 
So uh, what you want to do is you want to get a hold of your homeopathic practitioner. We have a we had a ton of animals with cancer being supported with homeopathy. This is when I want to sing praise with all things, all all integrative medicine, but homeopathy in cancer. I, from a per, my personal experiences, I don't know another modality of medicine that is as brilliant. And even when you're doing chemo and even when you're doing radiation, I, I worked with lots of people through Guelph University, uh, Veterinary University, because it's, it's the one modality, integrative modality, that you can use with radiation and chemotherapy and never worry there's going to be contraindications. So a lot of times they're, they're, they're scared. Oncologists are worried about working with um, herbs. They're worried about working with nutraceuticals because of the, the, the contraindications or reactions with the drugs. You don't ever have to worry about that with homeopathy and you can support the animal's body through that toxic process uh, really well if, if, that is the, if that is the way that they want to go. So get a hold of your homeopathic practitioner. Um, people have asked us at our clinic if we misdiagnose them because they seemed completely, their animals seemed completely normal, full of life, eating, happy, and playing. And their, this lasted anywhere from their, from their diagnosis to five years after, maybe even longer. We had, we had patients with cancer, diag with diagnosing, were diagnosed with cancer. And when they came to us, they didn't die from cancer, they died from old age. So let's say it was a, an eight-year-old dog or a 10-year-old cat, or, you know, we would be working with these animals and and it wasn't cancer that they died from. They died because they got old. They died when they were 14 and 16. So, or even, you know, sometimes even if it was just a month, that month was amazing for them. And, and the pet parents were happy that they made the decision because that was the most important thing is that they, their quality of life was, was really great. So, Part of cancer and diagnosing cancer, um, often there's tumors, and uh, I want to talk about navigating biopsies for tumors or growths. So this is a really touchy subject, um, and truthfully, it's solely up to you and your own philosophy around this. So some of you are probably asking, um, why would you not just routinely do it? Our clinic was at the mindset. This was a long time ago. This was like 15, 16, even 18 years ago. And we got more grief <laughs> with this than you could possibly imagine because we we wouldn't we wouldn't do biopsies if the if the if the if the choice was was clearly going to be that they weren't going to do um, chemotherapy or radiation we wouldn't, we would not do any kind of biopsies on any kind of tumors uh, or growths. So at our clinic, we're in the mindset, if, if the body was trying to contain something that was potentially dangerous, one of the ways it does this is by walling it off or putting it in jail until it is either removed naturally by the body. So the body absorbs it or it somehow stops the growth or more commonly in today's world by surgical in intervention. So it's, it's being held and contained until we can remove it. By taking a sample, two things can occur. You can inflame or traumatize the tumor wall and then it can get really angry and it can start to do all kinds of wacky things. Um, part of that is, is um, below, there's a chance that the cells can be activated and leak into the surrounding tissues, tissue or blood supply. And what that means is just to potentially speed up the metastases of the disease and provoke the tumors in the growth or um, speed up the cancer 
you know, when, when I say metastases, speed up that, that um, possibility of it moving into other organs and other parts of the body. Or if it's something like a fibrosarcoma, you can activate the inflammatory re response, the histamine response gets activated, and then the tumor gets exponentially more invasive, grows way, way, way faster, and can become just so locally invasive, it's, it's terrible. So we supported our clients by asking them to consider what would they do with the results? So this is a big one, something that we all, I honestly feel, I always tell these, you guys this, I honestly feel that our animals are our guides to our own health, our family's health, our loved one's health. Um, I think that everybody should do that with everything. It's like you go to your doctor, they say, okay, we want to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, okay, well then if you get, if we get this, what, what's the treatment? What's, what's going to happen? So if you were a person that would not do chemotherapy, so if you're, if with our clients, if they were clients that didn't want to do chemotherapy, would not do radiation, they, they would know that. Like it wouldn't matter what the, the results of the, of the diagnostics were, we would not do that. In that case, they would, usually elect to just leave it alone or address the issue holistically. There's so many more options today to deal with cancer or benign tumors um, other than conventional drug therapy, tons of them. If, there, if they were people who would choose chemo or radiation, again, there was no judgment, it's all personal preference, then diagnostics would depend on the site or the tumor or growth. So as an example, if we needed to, if, it, if we needed to make the diagnosis in a lymph node, then a fine needle biopsy would have to happen. The problem with fine needle biopsies is they often come back inconclusive. So then what you've done, you've stuck a needle in something, it comes out and they haven't been able to aspirate enough cells or aspirate the correct cells to get a confirmed diagnosis. So you will read the pathology report and the pathology report would often say, you know, it looked like this and the cells look like this. Um, you know, it looks like X, Y, and Z, but to be completely, to confirm it completely, a full removal of the lymph node would be needed and send off to the lab, um, which would be indicated. So sometimes, if it's 100% that they're gonna do that, sometimes you're almost best to do the removal of the tumor completely and then send it off to the lab, which is this next one. If the tumor would ultimately need to be removed, for example, a fibrosarcoma, an anal gland adenocarcinoma, rather than doing for us at our clinic, we wouldn't, we would not, we would not do that we would actually remove it. We would surgically remove the tumor. And then we would try to get the largest margins as possible. What that means is like, let's say the, the tumor is, here's my arm. Let's say the tumor is just that big. We would take this much, which would any surgeon would do this. We would take this much skin around it as much as we possibly could in so that we could um, uh, suture the, the wound together without any issues. And then we would send that whole thing off to the lab for, for the pathology report. Um, that way you can really, really be sure the correct therapies would be recommended. Another thing that, that I did, we did at our clinic and I've done a few times here for friends um, at clinics where they've brought their dogs and then they've gone into clinics is, is if we're taking off tumors, if, if, if the choice is to take the tumor off, and I haven't written this in here because I just kind of thought about this right now, but if you guys wanna write this down, if you're in a position where a tumor is being removed and we are want to do everything, especially with fibrosarcomas, we wanna do everything humanly possible that that tumor doesn't come back because 
often they do and often they will. Uh, what we always did is we would get sterile homeopathic remedy called carcinoma and carcinoma 30C. And then we would uh, inject the homeopathic carcinosin into the surgical site in which we removed the tumor. I don't have a vet hospital here and I don't work with anybody out here as far as vet hospitals go, but I have been asked a couple of times to come in and do that, that treatment within the clinic with, with um, the veterinarian with that clinic. So, and I've done that a few times and it is, it is, it works unbelievable. It, it's a, it's a phenomenal, it's a, a, a phenomenal treatment for, for that and a phenomenal support treatment for that. Um, the next thing is ultrasound guided biopsies. Again, it depends on the method of treatment. Much can be done with just an image and not a biopsy. But if the plan is to choose, choose again, chemotherapy and drugs, often the biopsy was needed to make sure that the correct drug was chosen. So as an example, again, um, if you're doing a, if you're looking at a kidney or a liver or um, the bowel or anything and you, and there's a visual tumor in there that you see with, uh, with the ultrasound, if you're not going to do chemotherapy and radiation, we would not touch that with a 10 foot pole. We would not, we would, we would a hundred percent not touch it. If one of our patients were, was somewhere else in, in the world and they were going in for an ultrasound, we would make sure that they signed the waiver saying that they were not allowed to do a fine needle aspirate of, of, of anything during the ultrasound. But if you're gonna do choose chemo or choose um, uh, radiation or something like that, or even surgery, then to go in and remove the, the, the tumor or possibly even the organ in, in hemangiosarcoma, um, then you would have to do it to make sure, well, you wouldn't do a biopsy with hemangiosarcoma, you would just go in and do it. But with anything else, we you would have to do a a fine needle biopsy in order to choose the correct chemotherapy drug. If in, whereas with our clients, sorry, with our clients, the majority of them didn't want to do that. So we wouldn't touch it. We would, we would treat on the basis of where the tumor was, how invasive it was, what it looked like, what its shape was, et cetera. If any biopsy or surgical remover was performed for the tumor or growth, we always gave aconite 1M and Arnica 1M uh, right away to decrease the, the trauma to the site. So diagnostic alternatives. This is, this is a, another big one and not, and not just for cancer, but just in general. So we always went with less invasive first. Um, if what's very invasive is a bone marrow biopsy and, and often they want to, they want to do that when it comes to osteosarcoma, which is an ugly cancer. Uh, it's one of the cancers that I'm doing research with right now with Dalhousie university. And, um, we, we, we try to avoid that on every way, shape and form we could. It's our opinion, and we work with some of the best board-certified radiologists, I think, in the, in the world, and some of the most incredible orthopedic surgeons. So what we would do in this case is we would, we would take an x-ray and send, if we really thought that it was osteosarcoma, we would take an x-ray and have a board-certified radiologist look at it and an orthopedic surgeon, both of them. And then weigh out our um, what they came back with, what 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 they were saying to do. It this is a really hard one because nobody wants to amputate a leg uh, if it's not if it's not osteosarcoma. But most radiologists and most orthopedic surgeons that see these things on a regular basis can can really look at it and go it's osteosarcoma or it's, it's, you know, it's, it's cancer. Or if they really weren't sure and they thought it was an infection, then they would, they would, they would recommend probably a bone marrow biopsy. But 
I've seen too many dogs go and get bone, go through the excruciating pain of getting a bone marrow biopsy and then going and having their leg removed when I think that they probably could have skipped that part if they had spoken to some really high, highly qualified um, uh, specialists. So the next thing would be exploratory surgery. That's really exploratory surgery just to look for something um, compared to an ultrasound, an MRI or a CAT scan. So those are much less invasive unless an ultrasound's been done and or an x-ray has been done and your dog has eaten a sock or your cat has eaten a Barbie doll arm or and they're looking at the x-ray or looking at the ultrasound and clearly seeing there's an obstruction in that gut, then you have to go in and you have to go in quickly to do exploratory surgery and remove remove whatever is, is, is creating the blockage. Because if you don't and you wait too long, then chances are part of that bowel is going to decay. Um, the blood flow is gonna be cut off, it's gonna decay. And then you're gonna to have to do um, a, something called a resection, which is removing part of the bowel. And, and you really wanna to try to avoid that as well. But for something that they're just looking for because they don't really know because they don't have access to an ultrasound or they don't have access to an MRI or CAT scan, then I definitely wouldn't be recommending, or I would, I would definitely be asking for an ultrasound or an MRI or CAT scan first. The next thing is urethral catheters. A cystocentesis is much less invasive. And um, I know you're gonna go, ugh, but it's where they take a long needle and they put that needle into the bladder and then they, they um, extract the urine from the bladder, which will be completely sterile, and you'll be able to see the results. Whereas a, a catheter, we always run the risk of it, putting it in the catheter, of, of putting it into the urethra. You run the risk of scarring their urethra, and it's a, a longer process in and just in our, our experience and in our opinion, the cystocentesis is a much less invasive procedure. Um, <clears throat> X-rays, abdom, now this is diff different if it's, if it's bone, right? So if you're worried about something in their abdomen it, or soft tissue, it's always more beneficial to go straight to an ultrasound rather than doing an X-ray. So if you're, if somebody's worried that, you know, someone's got a tumor on their, on their spleen, or there's a tumor in their liver, or there's a tumor on some organ in the abdomen, we would go directly to an ultrasound right away. You're, you're decreasing the amount of radiation dramatically that they're going to be exposed to. But not only that, when you're dealing with something with cancer or, or, or some kind of an autoimmune disease, you want to try and keep seriously want to try to keep their stress levels down as much as you humanly possibly can. So having to have them restrained and often sedated, why you would go to restraining and sedating an animal to do into an x-ray and then two days later sedating it and and, and um, restraining it again for an ultrasound, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, but if it's bone or if it's lungs, you have to do an x-ray. The, an ultrasound is not going to give you nearly the information that an x-ray will give. Um, so decrease bone or lungs, blah, blah, blah. Okay, got that one. Uh, this is something that is is important to uh, everything's important. I keep saying that, but um, it's a tough one. Trying too hard or not trying hard enough. And this is something that I struggled with. And this is something that I saw personally with thousands of clients. And I mean, thousands of clients where they either got into a situation where they were trying way too hard, like way too much that, that they lost sight of their animal and became focused on finding the cure, fixing their animal, doing the right thing, or not trying hard enough, getting scared and going, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. I can't handle this. I just, I just can't handle this and not doing anything or just giving away 
your animal or putting your animal into the hands of somebody else. And everybody has a different, it's a tough one because everyone has a different idea of quality of life or length of life. So what is truly more important to you? This is where you have to stand back and listen to your heart and go, what's more important to me? How long my animal lives or the quality in which it lives in while it's alive? The next one is how old is your animal? Are you going to put a 15 year old animal through you know, months and months and months of invasive procedures and being away from you and being in a clinic. Do you really want your old animal to be in the hospital more than with you in the last days of its life? And that is a real, I see that, I saw that every single solitary day. So because you start and you don't know when to say no, you don't know when to say I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I don't want to do another test. I don't want to bring them in for IV fluids anymore. I don't want to do this. It's a, it's a very, 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 very hard call. Um, there's a fine line between diagnostics and becoming a lab rat and losing all perspective of what you actually are accomplishing. And you're not going to understand that until you understand yourself and what you really want for your animal. So that's a, that's a, that's a heart to heart talk with yourself and your family and anyone that has anything to do with, with your animal to figure that out. Hopefully before you're in a position, if you ever are, that you have to be making those choices. Um, it's important to get a prognosis before doing more and more tests and what it's important to say, what is the treatment? What are the side effects? What is the life expectancy if the treatment is done? So the prognosis is, it is X, Y, and Z. And, you know, the average animal lives six months with chemo or three months without chemo. Like really, really get clear, clear guidance, ask as many questions as you possibly can, ask every single question, go home, do your homework and go back and ask more questions. If your animal has just been diagnosed with cancer, two or three days for you to do your homework and sit with that prognosis and sit with the information that you're getting, like I just said, chemotherapy, six months, 14 months without chemotherapy, three months to six months. Like find all of that stuff out before you make your decisions. What are the concerns with the treatment exact? One week every month they have to be treated. Then seven to 10 days, they're nauseous, in pain, they can't eat. And the, pro and the prognosis is three to nine months. Do you want um, them to, to be away from you once a month, sometimes once a week? Do you want them to go through this, this, um, these symptoms or these side effects just to have three to nine months more with them? And don't forget that, that, you know, just because you don't want to do chemo or radiation doesn't mean that you aren't going to, aren't going to seek out treatment. Doesn't mean that at all. And it also doesn't mean that you can start it. You can start it. If you want to start it, you can start it. You can call a homeopath. Like I said, you can work together as a team with homeopathy and the drugs. And if you see after two weeks, your dog is so sick or your cat is so sick and it's just not dealing with this, you can stop. You can 100% stop. And that's where, the, that's where the rub is a lot from a perspective of people, they've started it. So they, they're conditioned to think they, they've got to stop it. They've got to, they've got the, they have to go the whole road. And I've had a lot of people come to me when they've done that and wish that they hadn't, wish they had stopped, wish they had, that, that they'd listened to their heart. So um, my heartfelt wish is that your animal has 
if your animal has a diagnosis of cancer, that you reach out to a holistic animal professional who has years of experience treating animals because it's in my experience using holistic therapies have not only been on par, and I'm going out on a limb saying this, but it's absolutely true in my practice. Um, not only have I seen it on par with conventional op options, but more often than not, surpass it, exponentially surpass it on a perspective of life expectancy and, and life quality. So this is, this is uh, the next one, and it's a, it's a tough one. And I hope that we all did, um, we did a lot of crying when we did, when we, when we did this, but it's something that we all have to face at some point in our, in our animal's life. Um, for those of you that are going to be lucky enough to wake up one morning and your, 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 your heartfelt animal and your, you know, your little soulmate there just passes away in its sleep or you come home and, you know, they're really old and you find them curled up in their chair and, and then, and they've died that I wish more than anything for everybody. And, but it, I don't think that happens as much as euthanasia does. So, uh, I think the, the big question I got with thousands of, of animals was, you know, is how, when is it holding on too much or letting go too soon. Um, this is a place where you need to sit alone and connect with your animal. So you don't sit alone in a room or maybe if you have to, that's fine too, but connect, try and connect with your animal. Uh, and first of all, I have to say, it's my personal belief that they never, that they never leave and that they're always with us. And I always say to people, how can't they be? The lessons that they teach us of unconditional love. I don't know anything anybody that has ever shown me and taught me what unconditional love actually means. And what we experience with that animal, um, everything else sort of is pale in comparison to, to what they teach us and what we, what we feel in return, right? I'm not saying that we don't love, we don't love like that. But the love that we get from our animals that we receive surpasses a lot of love out there. And, and I think it is because it's unconditional. So whether your animal is with you in physical form or not, the best gift he could give to you and the best gift you could give to him is to hold on to that idea as close to your heart as possible. This is the way he's able to give you constant joy forever. So I, I tell people, even though this talk, we're talking about euthanasia, is, is feeling the feeling. So when your animals are healthy and vibrant and young, or even if they're starting to decline and they're starting to become geriatric or they have some kind of disease, Sit with them when they're already here and feel the joy that you receive from them and the love that you give to them. And, and, and write it down, remind yourself of that feeling because I, can, I honestly can say that you can still feel that feeling even when they're not, they're not with us. Um, my experience has been this, when we can settle into that place, our choices of whether to keep trying at all costs or to let go will be clear and you'll be able to hear and see what your animal is showing and asking you. When we haven't allowed ourselves to be in that space with our animals, when it comes time to making that decision, do I keep doing more diagnostics? Do I keep letting them go to the clinic? Do I keep doing the chemotherapy? Do I keep, 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 keep? If you've allowed yourself to get that experience, you can settle back, look at your notes, look, create a journal, create a journal of, of, of when your animal's healthy, how you want it to look, how, how you want that experience to be. And then when the time comes, you have a, you have a, you have a starting place, you have a, you have a foundation that you can 
go to and make make some some hard decisions, but may, hopefully make them with more clarity. Um, so some support that might help is have it planned um, as best as possible. For example, if your animal's geriatric risk, cancer, or life-threatening illness, decide ahead of time how and where you would like to say goodbye. I feel really passionate about this because of the countless euthanasias I've been honored to be part of. The plan ones have been the best to keep the energy as calm and stress-free as possible. Um, I, I honestly have to say that some of the, <clears throat> I knew I was going to do this, um, some of the goodbyes that I was part of was part of some of the most beautiful experiences of my life. They can, they can, they can be life-changing and I've always found that if I could help support someone in creating that plan, my experience has been that they've been like that. They've been incredibly beautiful experiences. So where to do it if there's a choice. Uh, my personal choice is at their home. It's where they feel the safest and the most relaxed. Hopefully now that some of the, some of the COVID things have been lowered, that this is going to be able to happen again. We did this more than we, we, we did our best to be able to go to the homes of our patients and our clients to euthanize their animals at home. Um, if something happened and it, it, and it wasn't a planned thing uh, and we got a call and you know we, were, we, we couldn't move our schedules around or we, something else was happening that was an emergency or something at the clinic, um, it's, it's, a, it's what we would do is we would do it in the car, which is I'm gonna to get to on, on the last piece. But when we would go to the homes of, of these animals, we really felt that it helps that other animals and families um, understand if they're around. So if you have children, again, this is a personal, a really personal view. Uh, I've been part of lots of euthanasias where everyone was there. You know, everyone close to the animal was there. Children were there, other animals were there. Um, we're not used to that. We, we're so removed from death. We, you know, our, our, our personal family, you know, is taken to the hospital and, and our children are removed from seeing death and, and people don't die at home anymore. And it is, um, it's sort of hidden or put in the hands of nurses and doctors. And if it's planned and peaceful, what better way to experience and honor our, our beloved friend. And it's also, I think a way to not be as of afraid of death, especially for kids. Um, I, I, I know lots of kids. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time and some of the children that were part of these euthanasias initially for me, when I first started my practice were young adults, you know, when I, when I left Vancouver and they remember them, they, they, they really felt that it was um, because it's such a beautiful experience. They really, it, it shifted their fear around death, even with themselves a lot. So it's, it's something that, again, that you need to really sit with and, and decide what, what's best for your family. If there's a dog in the house or another cat in the house or, it, or, or, their, or their animal friend, I always told people just after the euthanasia, I, I didn't like taking them back to the clinic with me. I tried to um, counsel people to leave the animal in their bed, like in their pet bed, um, and in an, or a, a space that was um, where they used to lie. And, and that's the planning part. So, you know, you, you have their bed ready and you put some plastic underneath their bed and you, or, or not just make sure, making sure because they will urinate after, after they, they're euthanized, but they can stay there. And then, and it's, it's, it's an interest. I know some people are just going, oh my gosh, probably right now, but to have them die and then just be removed 
it's pretty shocking and it's it, it doesn't give often the people in the family or the animals in the family a chance to really settle in to what happened and it's a it's a the people that have decided to do that, it was really great for them. They, they really felt like they had that time. You know, sometimes when you're at a practice in the clinic, you're, they're euthanized in a room and you only have a very short period of time. And then as soon as they're euthanized, you know, vet, vets try and do their best to allow you to, to, to stay with them. But often you don't get to stay as long as you feel like you need to stay to grieve and be able to actually let them go. So that's, that's another, that's another option. Um, if you simply, uh, it's not an option to come to the house for any, many animals, uh, the car is their second home. And we would, lots of times we would assist in the end, the, life, the end of life process in, in their car. It's not awkward at all or difficult. So don't let anyone convince you that it is that, that they can't get a vein or that they can't get close enough to the animal. It's just, it's just they're feeling awkward. It's not an awkward, it's, it's easy. It's a very easy process to do. If your animal's really dehydrated or they simply say, no, we're not doing this, we can't do this, we're, we're too worried that it's gonna go sideways or wrong, then just ask them if they can do a sedation process and have that sedation process happen in the car and then take your animal, if it's small enough, then you can just carry them out of the car when they're sedated and bring them into the clinic. Um, this, this, is a, this is a pretty next step with many animals if, if, we can't, if we couldn't go to their house. If you have to go to the clinic, um, then we would recommend always giving aconite one M before you leave the house, then again in the car before you go in. And if you're scared, if you're scared or you're, you're really feeling traumatized about this and, and, you're, and you're really nervous, it, it never hurts anyone that's around, that's going to be around this for the person themselves to take a dose of aconite as well. If, you're do, if your vet does sedation prior to the procedure, please ask them to allow you to be present for the sedation and do not take your animal out of the room to do it. Being with your animal when he is leaving, his physical body is one of the hardest things that will happen in your life, but I really support you in doing so. Although you may hear from your veterinarian or friends, you can just leave him or you know, you, you drop him off at the clinic and they, 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 they put them to sleep when you're not there or it's less stressful to say goodbye when you're not upset. To me, that's just nonsense. If you think for one second your animal doesn't know your feelings all the time, no matter what you say or do, you're kidding yourself. They don't care if you're sad and crying. They understand if you've made the choice of how in your heart you want this to be, it is less likely there, um, it will, hold on. It will be less likely there will be fear, which is the most negative emotion at all. So what that what I'm saying is if you don't, allow yourself to feel the grief and the sadness. Sometimes that can shift into fear. So when you're allowing your emotions to be expressed and you're crying and you're holding them and you're, and you, you know, you're telling them that you're going to miss them and it's okay for them to go, but that, you know, you're just being honest with them. That allows that real emotion to come out. If you feel like you have to be stoic and solid and you can't cry for your animal and you can't be upset, sometimes that shifts into a fear or stress hormone. And that's a much more negative emotion than, than sadness. If you guys just can't be there, if something happens and you just can't do it. It's just way, way too hard for you to be present. Um, that's okay. You can't, uh, you can't come down on yourself or you can't feel that you're a horrible person. Um, your animals, your animals going to understand you just, like I said, you just need to talk to them and, and, and let them know what's happening. Um, just don't make the choice from what, what I'm saying to you is don't make that choice 
with what someone else is telling you to do. So if someone says to you, you're going to be too upset, you shouldn't go. That's not true. If somebody says to you, you know, just, you know, you can just drop them off and they'll do it. That's, that's not true either. So if this is your choice not to be there because you think you're going to pass out or you just, you just physically can't do it then see if a friend or a family member can be there or a friend of your dogs or someone that's known your dog or your dog walker or whomever can be there. But no matter what, guys, do not drop your animal off to a clinic to have it done. And I know that there's some of you out there going, does that even happen? Does that even exist? It happens a lot more than you think it does. And unfortunately, there's some clinics that are that would never do this but clinics are really, really busy and often they're taken back and they're put into a cage until, until that process can happen. So it might happen if we're, if we're lucky, it might happen right away. And if we're not so lucky, they might be sitting in their cage until after surgery. So they're sitting around that one of the most stressful places for them to be um, before they're euthanized. And I, I just don't, I just don't think that's fair. So it's like I said, it's no way to spend their last day or even their last few moments. And people are appalled when I say that, but it happens. One is waiting too long or not doing it too soon. So at our clinic, we supported natural deaths without euthanasia, which means using remedies and functional medicine. We also completely supported euthanasia. But in either case, this has always has to be the most difficult part, even personally, um, as I have absolutely done both. So I've allowed some of my animals to allow, I've supported some of my animals and in, in to die naturally, and I've euthanized my animals. Um, there's been times when I wished I had done it a day sooner to relieve the suffering that last day presented. And there's also been times when I've wondered, was it too soon? And what I can tell you from my heart, because this is what I'm doing, I'm just giving you guys my experience. I'm not telling anybody to do anything. The one that um, has been the hardest for me is if I've been contemplating euthanizing them. And I know that it's going to be in the next week, let's say. I know it's, it's really coming soon. And I just want them to have one more nice day. But then that one more nice day doesn't turn into one more nice day. It turns into a horrible day that they're suffering. And then I choose to do it right then. That's harder on me than knowing in my heart that they're literally in their last couple of days. And, I, and I'm choosing to do it one day or two days sooner and in a space where they're leaving you know, in, in a relatively, um, relatively pain-free or suffering space. Uh, this is when treating your animal naturally becomes so clear. So when, whatever, whatever experience you've had in your past too, from other animals that you've had to euthanize, sometimes that's a good indicator to bring forward into your next experience of this or to support a friend through this. Um, when treating your animals naturally, things become a lot clearer because there's not that suppression and usually they're doing so well and then have a very fast decline, which is always was always our, clin our clinic's goal, is not having a long drawn out death, but an incredible quality of life until one day it's just isn't anymore and then you know because you've um because you choose to have it be in that clarity so what that means again is that when you a lot of you uh, many of you that are sitting out there tonight are are people that are already trying to use less drugs trying to have a more natural health plan for your animals when you do that there's a lot less confusion about um, when I talk about drug pathology, the death process is a lot less complicated. When there's not a whole bunch of drugs on board, the process of death, the death process 
is not often not as complicated or difficult and it happens faster. And that's a good thing. To, and I know that sounds weird to say they die faster, but when you've experienced the amount of deaths that I have in, in my practice, my really, 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 really good friend, Dr. Sue Armstrong and I, she used to talk about her airplane uh, metaphor and then we would talk together about it. And she used to always say that she thinks a great life is when they're born, they take off and then they're flying and they're going to some great tropical island. Like we're going to some great and we're on the plane and there's a few bumps, but it's exciting and life is pretty good. And there's a few bumps, but then it comes back to normal and we're going along. And then when it's, when we're not going along anymore, it declines. And what we want for them is that fast, easy decline and easy landing. And that landing is landing into that, that space where the physical body is no longer, longer part of their spirit. And for us, the more ease of that, that trip, we always felt that we did the best that we could do for that animal. So we would talk on the phone and I would be sad and I would just be sad. You know, I would say, yeah, we just lost so-and-so, you know, I've been working with them for X amount of time and stuff. I said, but I would, and she'd say, well, how was the landing? And I would be like, it was amazing. You know, it, she had cancer, but you wouldn't even have known it. And then when we did, when she started showing symptoms, we had, we put her to sleep in three days. So it was, not a lot of suffering and it went quickly. And when it did go quickly, it went exactly sort of not as planned, but what, what you would really want for something that you love that much. So we would, we would often compare our airplane me metaphors and, and, and that was how we would gauge if we did the, not did the best job, but that, that we felt that, that we offered the support that we've always wanted for, for all of our patients. Uh, Julie, before you continue, yeah. that was really moving. Um, Danielle said, can anybody else feel the state of grace that Julianne has just created? Can we just take one moment for like a super deep breath together here? Because that was like really powerful. <laughs> yeah, so I think, that is what we can do yeah. is we can, we can just take a, take a really, a really deep breath and settle in to finding that place of peace rather than fear. Cause, cause that's an important one is to be in the present moment so that you can, you can support your animal as best you can um considering but I know that all you guys are doing that anyway so you wouldn't be here I wouldn't be um engaging with a bunch of people that that I didn't feel completely could um find a way to navigate this and and be as present and show up like if someone said something you said someone said something about grace well that's that's a perfect word right, is, is showing up with the grace and the, and the love to be able to, to navigate something so intensely intimate, really, with, with your animal. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and we're going to have questions after. So that's why, um, what I'm going to do next is, is recap the series. And I'm so glad you did that, Stephanie, because I was just on a, <laughs> on a, I just want to make sure that I get everything in. So sometimes I just want to share things as fast as I possibly can so that I'm not missing anything. So, um, so in the, in the series, the first part of the series, the first, the first uh, Wednesday, do your best, find what category you fall in and start with baby steps. Organize your want list, find a vet and a holistic practitioner, get all your holistic documents signed and organized and put in your file, 
Make sure you get all your records and diagnostic reports, not just your receipts. They won't help with anything. Get out in front of the care rather than trying to fix it in the moment of crisis or stressful times. Um, be with your animal. Do not let them take them into the back unless it's for an x-ray or surgery, obviously. You can get off the merry-go-round no matter how far down the drug road you are. Just get clarity and work to rebuild and create rebalance. So that's a big one because a lot of people don't think that they can. They think once they've started a drug, they can never stop. And that's just simply not true. You can wean an animal off of anything and you can do it in a very safe way with support. You can't do anything wrong. If something doesn't work out, it's just a lesson for the next time to know what you don't, what you do not want. And that's an important one too, because we tend to beat ourselves up and think, you know, oh, we, we really, we really didn't do that well, or we bombed on this. And then we were so filled with guilt or, or, or remorse that we didn't do something. You can't, you can't be that way. You guys doing this, you're taking more responsibility than probably 90% of the people out there doing their own health care and their children's health care. So anything you're doing is more than most. And you need to pat yourself on the back and understand that you're doing an incredible job. Uh, you know your, your animal better than any professional. And that includes your veterinarian. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a negative way at all, but we've been trained with our children, our family and our own health care and our animals that we don't know because we don't have that training. And that's just simply not true. You know, your animal better than anyone and you need to be their voice and you need to be their advocate. Um, step back. So with, with all of this, everything that I've taught you, just step back, breathe, and lead with your heart, and you'll always make the right decision. But it's, it's getting the confidence to be able to step back. You know, know that you, can, you don't have to make immediate decisions unless it's you know, a hit by car or something like that. You have the time to say, just hang on, I need to think about this. You, you are allowed that time. So thank you so much. I love you guys. And I'm so grateful for all of you and what you've taught me and um, what you continue, you guys continue to teach me by me trying to help navigate you every single time I do this. I think I, I, remember something from what I did 20 years ago, or I, I, it's, it's always incredible what, what you guys are giving me. Um, thank you for joining me through this series. It truly means the world to me um, that you're here educating yourself for the betterment of your animal. It, it really does. It, it makes my heart very happy to know that there's so many people out there <clears throat> that want, want to do this for their animals. So be courageous, be empowered, and keep doing what you're doing. And just before we, we go into questions, I really am in the process of writing a post for all of you about things that we can do at home to reduce your animal stress. Again, I was going to try to have this part of it, but we just don't have the time. But there's so much you can do at home, you guys. You have no idea. Like you can do blood if you have a diabetic animal. You can learn how to do your own curves with a little, um, the same thing that you use for your thumb and you can put it in their, on their pads or in their, in their ears that you don't have to take it in. It's less expensive. It's, um, it's sometimes even better because they're not as stressed at home. Sometimes it, people that don't like to do that, it's more stressful. I should just go to the clinic, but they're, I'm, I'm going to write about all the different things that you can do to, at home, if you can, if it, if it, if it fits with your personality. Um, subcutaneous fluids, rather than taking them in and having to put them on um, 
uh, or even get subcutaneous fluids at home with, we'll be talking about that next Wednesday with cats with kidney disease. It's so easy to do, to do fluids at home and not stress your animal by taking them in all the time to have it done. Okay, so thank you and um, uh, blessings to you all and all your adored beasts. And these are just some of my crew and my, my mom, um, who was the, who was the starting of all of this with her, with her dog rescue and animal rescue when I was three. And she died when she was 93 and she was still part of rescue when she was 90. So yeah, she, she was an amazing woman. And I know that she's with me during all of this, all of these lectures, the same way as Della is the, the, the dog that's over with the donkey in the corner. That was my Della. And the same way Pepper is Pepper's up, up the top. She was a Italian, one of my Italian rescues. I had like seven of them when I was in Vancouver. Um, Winston is, uh, Winston and Jenny are the two donkeys down below. I had them, they were both, I think when I, Jenny was close to 40 and Jenny was one of the ones that I was very lucky in and she, she, she made the choice herself when she was gonna leave. She was like very stubborn. <laughs> so, so, uh, she made that choice on her own, which was great because it would have been very hard for me. Okay, so do you want, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Yeah, there's a few questions if you don't mind. Or can you stop sharing for me? I think, oh no, there, no, yeah. it's a new share. Stop share. Can you stop sharing for me? Okay, yeah. is that good? Stop share. Oh, there you got go. it. You got there before okay. I did. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a few questions. Thank you, Julie, for everything. Okay. So, um, Julie, really quick, could you could you talk about a remedy that's best for a nausea in a 14 and a half year old cat? This is for Robin. Um, I guess it would be like, why is it nauseous, though? Right. Right. You always want it, more. it's a cat. Mm -hmm. If it's a cat, we will probably cover a lot of nausea on Wednesday next week because we're going to yeah. be calling talking about kidney failure. Um, we're going to be talking about hyperthyroidism, but you know, cats and nausea, phosphorus, you, know, you really want to know what it is. Is it nausea from inflammatory bowel disease? Is it kidney issues? So then you can hone in on that and then take their personalities and, um, their modalities and everything into account. But for, for Robin, I think it would be really great if you could join on Wednesday. Oh, for sure. Robin will be there. Yeah. She's, she's here every time. Um, Elizabeth's asking, what's the link for next Wednesday's, dis Wednesday's discussion? I'll send that out via email. So if you signed up for this event or any of the past events, I'll be sending you an email early next week to, to uh, give you an invite. Here's one from Ellen. If a dog has been on antibiotics for a month and the vet thinks that the right, it's the right time to stop, but there's still a few skin irritations visible, could you offer your suggestions? Should a negative culture be seen before stopping antibiotics? We don't like antibiotics, but we also don't want to stop too soon. We're planning to do a yeasty beast protocol to when we stop the antibiotics and we're doing phytos flora and liver support now. Thank you for your advice. During now, okay. Um, I, I think you've got to go with, I mean, for a veterinarian to say we should stop the antibiotics, I would, I would take their call. Um, I know what you're saying because sometimes if you stop them too soon, then you're, then you, you run the risk of getting antibiotic resistance. But if you've been doing phytos flora, hopefully you are uh, replant. Uh, replanting or re-inoculating that canine, that specific canine strain. And of oh, my echoing? No, oh, sorry. Okay. I think that's me. Okay. Um, I would stop and then support them, continue to support them with the, with, I would actually go to leaky gut before I would go to yeasty beast. So I would do the leaky gut protocol if they did just come off of antibiotics. And then I would go into yeasty beast, or 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 I would do two weeks of of uh, leaky gut, then two weeks of yeasty beast, and then to to do our 
do that protocol. The relief protocol. Relief protocol. You maybe want to put that in there for them in the chat. Yeah, or Ellen, I will. It's on, our, it's on our website too, right? Yeah, and you can email our team, uh, Kaylin and the customer success team, Suzanne, Lori, all those forms. ladies. Yeah. Someone's asking if you can copy the forms to fill out. I think that's the ones for oh, the file. Sure. Yeah, yeah 100%. Sure. The, yeah. One, the, one, the one template I made specially for you guys. Mm -hmm. So you can take that template and your vet can actually tweak it where he feel he or she feels the most comfortable doing it. So Nita, in, in for that, email our team because we've got them on hand to pass over to you. And the email for that, I'll put it in the chat here. It's questions, plural, questions at adoredbeast.com. And the ladies on our success team would be happy to give you a hand with that. Shelly, does both ALT and ALP rise in Cushing's or can one of them be normal and the other one be high? Yep, both. <laughs> That's why I'm saying you, you really have to take everything into account. They, they're often both elevated, but sometimes not always. So that's why you're going to do the, the urine cortisol creatinine ratio um, uh, and the ultrasound, and then also look at their symptomatology if you're going to do the natural, the natural protocol. Thanks, Julie. And just base it on, and just base it on that, right? Uh, Julie, would homeopathic remedies work while an animal is on antibiotics? Would homeopathic protocols work on with animals on antibiotics? Yeah, like can you be giving remedies while you're yeah. while your animals? Yeah, for sure. That's the great thing about homeopathy, is that it doesn't have any contraindications, right? You're not gonna, you're not going to. There's a lot of stuff with antibiotics. There's a lot of a lot of things that you can give while they're on antibiotics. You might have to separate the timing, not give it at the same time as the antibiotics, but antibiotics isn't something that you, that you worry as much about with giving, giving support or integrative medicine to. Thank you. Okay. So Margaret's dog has a recurring mast cell cancer about 18 low grade tumors since the age of three. She's 11 mm -hmm. now. Okay. Good for her. Started off with a wide margin surgeries, but there were yep. so many, we turned to cryo surgery. Right. She also has pug myelio myeliopathy. Uh, he's, on a bunch of, mm -hmm. he's on a bunch of supplements and herbs. Uh, there's there's not really a question there. I don't know if you have anything to offer or any insight onto that, Julie. I would still look at if a, if you haven't done a thyroid panel, it's such it's such a non invasive procedure. I would I would do a thyroid panel, and I'm sure if you're on lots of supplements, one of them is um, quercetin, and quercetin is is really really good for for histamine. You want to be supporting. Anything with mast cell, you want to really, really concentrate on their liver. And because the liver helps with the balancing of histamine, of histamine, um, try to give whatever you're feeding or make sure that you're, they're low histamine foods. And um, yeah, I mean, if she's, she's, a, what, she's, she's 11 now, you said? I believe it was 14. Or 14. 11. No, you were right. 11. 11. 11. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously she's, she is strong enough to keep pushing these, you know, pushing these things out and then they're being removed and then she's, she's able to compensate well enough. So constitutional remedy is a big one for that when they're so reoccurring. Um, I would, I would, contact a homeopath and see about giving her a constitutional remedy. I would check her thyroid panel if she hasn't been checked. And uh, with the myelopathy too, there's so much stuff you can be giving for myelopathy, like a remedy is called conium and causticum. And there's, there's lots of, um, lots of support for myelopathy. And, you know, it's interesting too, because, you know, the, like with thyroid disease, they can have 
neurological paralysis, right? So uh, even if it comes back negative, maybe looking at supportive glandulars would be good. Ask your vet about supportive glandulars just because she's been, she, she I don't know if she's been spayed. He, I'm but sorry, she, I think it was a typo. He, he. If it's a he or a she, um, they would have that lack of sex hormones. So the spay and neuter protocol, uh, supporting all the hormones, amino acids, but that all helps with the homeostasis coming back into balance, back into balance or creating homeostasis. But specifics would be liver, quercetin, looking at homeopathic remedies. There's a homeopathic remedy called histamina, hmm. which is specifically for um, balancing histamine reactions. So there's lots and lots and lots you can do. Julie, when you say the liver, I'm thinking liver tonic. When you say balancing, I'm thinking phytosplora. When you say antioxidants, I'm thinking phytosynergy. Like, am I wrong? Yeah, or? No, no. Okay. Well, that's. No, there's, there's many, many things you can do. And um, we're coming out with something very exciting in January. But with phytosflora, the cool thing about that is that because it's the canine strain, um, there's so like I, I always say that we know nothing about bacteria. Uh, we're just, we're just, just touching the surface of it, but we know that there's so many different strains of bacteria that create the metabolites for everything. So finding that right strain in her gut or his gut that helps support the metabolite, the metabolites that then support histamine reaction or the overindulgence of histamine or the, or too much, the triggering of too much histamine. So there's, there, she's a pug and she's 11. They can live a really long time. So I would, I would be saying if she's, if she's still, she's had this since three, she wants to, she still wants to be around. I would explore lots of different things. She's got some get up and go by the sounds of it. Yes. <laughs> Um, hey, before we take any more questions, I know we've talked about a couple of things that can be supportive tonight for your animals. Um, we are releasing Black Friday early for all the attendees to, to tonight's um, episode three. So for everyone that's here, if you're curious to do a little bit of shopping or you have some things in mind to help support your animal, um, use code BF21, Black Friday 21 at checkout and the whole site, the whole store is 20% off. Okay. So that's, that's our little gift to you. Tonight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For everyone that wants to get in there. Uh, it's a, it's our biggest. Uh oh, oh she froze. That means I might have to do something actually. Oh, am I still oh, there? There you, are. Froze. you froze for a minute. <laughs> I was like, ah! oh my <laughs> what were we saying no, before we went exactly. live? Before we went live, right. I was freezing, and Julie's like, "As long as you have like two minutes to do the intro, like as long as it's you, I can do the presentation. It's okay. We'll be fine." Except for now, when I'd have to answer the questions, <laughs> I'd have to be going down. Doesn't matter. Go ahead. Okay, Ellen. A good point about the biopsies making things worse, and sometimes, are there types or places of tumors on the body? or inflamed cells that are more or less likely um, to get inflamed or irritated or provoked from being biopsied? Do you have any experience with that? They all do. Okay, good. No, they all do. Um, that's what, when I was talking about anal gland, the anal gland ones can just go insane. Obviously, um, mast cell tumors can just blow up and, and, and be really, much, much, much worse. Fibrosarcomas can be much, much, much worse. They can become just scary, invasive, very, very fast. They can, they can be like this. And then all of a sudden they're like, the, like massive. I, I don't like, I personally don't like touching any, any lumps or bumps, especially if you're not going to do anything. Yeah. Are not going to do a thing. You're not going to go the conventional route. Thanks, Julie. 
Um, Gail's so grateful for you sharing your knowledge and time. This has been wonderful. Her boy has been on thyroid tabs for two years. With changes in dosage, I still feel that something's not right with him. Is there something else I can do? So she, he's been on thyroid medication for two years? Yeah, that's right. And there's something not right. Um, did she say anything about her medication being raised or lowered or anything like that? Uh, changes in dosage, but not whether or not it's been... Help. Um, okay. Um, You know, if it's, if it's, if it's immune mediated thyroid problems, which a big part of them are, is, is finding when, when, when dogs are diagnosed with thyroid disease, often you're not told whether it's, um, autoimmune thyroiditis or which, which one of them it is. But in, in a case like this, I would be really, 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 really looking at um, immune modulators. Because if it is the body attacking the thyroid, <clears throat> so the immune, the immune module, the immune mediated one, yes, you're giving the thyroid supplement, but is that stopping the body from continuing it to attack, right? So his, his dose has been raised and lowered. Is that what that says? Yes, Jean Dodds told me autoimmune. Okay. So anytime, and Jean Dodds is amazing. If you guys, when I, I was going to say that too, um, we were the first clinic in Canada to work with Jean Dodds. And she's the most, one of the most brilliant women I've ever met in my whole life. And if you, if your veterinary clinic will do it, I would always be sending the blood. My dog's going to start barking. Um, I would always um, send it to Gene Dodds if, if he's good, he'll go down. Um, I would always try and send the full thyroid panel to Gene Dodds because she's just so brilliant in, in her remarks. If she's still doing this, if her remarks that come back with her report are, are just a wealth of knowledge. So if she has said it's autoimmune, um, now my dog is working too. Um, if she, she said that, then my biggest, my biggest thing for you would be to add things to your dog's diet that are immune modulators. So not to boost your dog's immune system with like echinacea and things that boost the system, but give your dog, when we're talking about modulation, a modulator, when it goes up, it brings it down, helps to bring it down. When it goes too low, it helps to bring it up. So part of thyroid disease is the reoccurrence of infections, right? Because of it, it's, it's not regulating the metabolism correctly. So when you're giving um, um, any, when you're dealing with any animal like that, your when it goes up, it starts to attack the thyroid that the, the metabolism slows down, which then creates a great platform for secondary infections to happen, right? So the immune system gets compromised then. So it's going up and down like this and it's not, it's not, it's not, um, nothing's modulating it. So immune modulation is, is anytime your animals have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, that's what you want to focus on is modulating the immune system. Um, our, our larch is an immune modulator. Um, our, uh, phytos flora, the canine strain has incredible immune modulating benefits. Phenomenal. Uh, our turkey tail is a, is a, is an immune modulator. It modulates, helps to modulate the immune system. So there's three things right there that you can, uh, you can try to incorporate to see if you can get some balance in some balance in there. Uh, little success story with the phytos flora. My guy was getting a bit of an itch. You know, when you touch them, they start getting that leg that can't stop. Mm -hmm. Phytoflora, three days, gone. It's, 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 it's pretty amazing how fast it can populate, <laughs> too, right? Like the, 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 if, if the body is still pretty vital, right? It just sort of takes it and just knows exactly what to do with it. Our bodies are so phenomenal.
like our 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 innate intelligence and animals innate intelligence to know how to heal given the right tools it's just it's just it's so it's so incredible um danielle's just asking please list the immune modulators one more time so large so all of our prebiotics that are in all of our probiotics is an immune modulator uh turkey tail is an immune modulator and fight the canine strain of phytos florus or the 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 canine specific strain that's in the probiotic phytos flora it has it has a ton of research to show that it has immune modulating um benefits thanks julie welcome um, carol has a nine-year-old boy with cushings and he's become terrified of nail trims. The vet wants to give him a drug the night before and the day of. Any tips on what I can do instead? Could you perhaps start, try doing it at home? Like at home, that's what I was going to say. You know, it takes a while, but even if you could do one nail a week. There you go. Seriously, one nail a week. Um, aconite really helps for fear. Uh, CBD oil can, can really help. But if you were to give some CBD oil or so long as your dog can, can handle it um, and, and give it some aconite and I don't know what kind of dog it is, but if you could just get one nail done and then don't, don't touch their feet for another week and then get another nail done. And whatever you do, take the tiniest little bit off. Mm -hmm. Because if you do one nail a week and you keep doing one nail a week, <laughs> you will you will keep them, you'll keep them, you'll be able to keep them short. If you do too much at once and you cut the quick, then you're gonna be in a worse pickle than, than you were to begin with. But I highly recommend trying to do them at home. That's, and then you kind of build a routine, right? Lots yeah, of lots treats. of treats, tons and tons of treats. Yeah. Pick up his nail, have someone going like this with a treat in front of their face so that they're looking at the treats, snip the nail, and it's done. Yeah. Like, I know it sounds crazy that it's going to take all that time to get their nails done and maybe how long are their nails going to be. But I would really try to stay away from drugs, more drugs on top of drugs with Cushing's. Thank you. Rosemary, uh, her dog, Nelson, he's being diagnosed with Cushing's. I've not started any treatment yet since the vet will not confirm 100% that it is Cushing's. You might be a good candidate for one of the slides when Julie talked about the full panel. He's lost a lot of weight and muscle mass. His hind legs are frequently given out. Is there something I can do or feed to grow muscle strength? He's weak, but he's in good spirits. She should she should reach out her vet doesn't want to do yeah. the drugs he's been diagnosed with cushing's haven't started yeah. treatment but the vet's not willing to confirm 100 percent that yes this is cushing's so the vet doesn't want to i just want to get this clear the vet doesn't want to start the drug because he can't confirm 100 percent. that's what i'm understanding yeah so if it's the vet that's a good thing if the vet's saying, I don't want to start this drug, then you have a really good vet <laughs> um, because that drug is a hardcore drug. So you really don't want to start it unless you know. He might be someone that would be interested in working with a homeopath to put your dog on the Cushing's homeopathic protocol. Um, that's the first thing that I would do. That's a, the very first thing I would do is I reach out to your vet and say, would you be, would you be willing to work with a, um, you know, either a veterinarian that does this homeopathic protocol or a homeopath that does this homeopathic protocol, or would you work with me while I did it? Like that would be something that first thing that I would do right away. It's hard to put muscle mass back on when, when the body is deteriorating it like it's 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 a you're kind of fighting a losing battle you gotta you have to you have to work with with the cushings for sure thanks Trina. or the symptom symptomatology of cushings uh ti 
if you've had a needle, if you've had needle biopsies in the past, is there any way to reverse the possible or likely trauma that it's caused? Yeah, you can still do aconite and arnica, even, even years later. It's always helpful. Always helpful. I would do aconite and arnica um, three times a day for two days. And you can do, if it didn't just happen, I would just do 200 C. I wouldn't do 1M. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so Janet, what, what, time for one more here, Julie? Sure. I'm listening to tonight's presentation. I'm wondering if thyroid is still in play with my seven-year-old pit mix, who many vets down the road, an inconclusive botched biopsy has been diagnosed with lupus. She mm. has eight, she has HX of two ACLs. Her joints continue to exude serosangeous. Sorry. Sir, yeah. Fluids, eyes are red and nose is crusty. I'm sure her gut needs support. Maybe a bit of a case too big to address at this moment. Well, yes and no. If it's never had a thyroid test, I would do it. Like 100%, I would do it. I would send it to Jane Dodds with all of that history that they just gave me or gave you. I would send it to Dr. Dodds. That's the first, that's the first thing that I would do. And then if it's lupus, I would be addressing the same thing as I told the person previous is lupus is an autoimmune disease and you and, and the more you can work with um, immune modulators and, and, you know, I don't want to keep saying, you know, get a homeopath, get a homeopath, but um, we have, we have worked. I'm not going to, I mean, I definitely would never say that we would cure lupus, but I can say that animals that have had severe diagnosis like lupus or, or, or whatever, we have been able to maintain them and get their body to compensate so well. I actually did a, a lecture for a veterinary, um, a veterinary conference with, I don't even know how many, how many cases. And I, and I called it the compromising. I don't even remember what I called it, but it was about how well um, animals can compensate. And even looking, even when you retest their blood, their blood doesn't even look that great, but they look amazing. And that's what we have to keep remembering. Yes, you could have chronic disease, but it's a, it's a name. And you can actually look at blood work. I know so many animals that are doing great and they look at blood work and they, everything gets changed and then they crash. Or you look at blood work and everything looks, everything looks, oh no, hold on, opposite. You look at blood work, everything looks crap, crappy, but the animal's doing amazing. They change all the drugs and then the animal crashes. Or the animal's doing amazing, you look at the blood work and the blood work looks crappy. And then they put them on drugs and then the animal crashes or a different drug again and then the animal crashes. It's, or, or they don't do anything and the animal just keeps getting sick. We have to, we have to separate that what we see on paper is a, is a, is a, in that moment. And it's, and their blood work is not indicative of their vitality all the time. There can be lots and lots of stuff going on and their vitality sucks and their, their blood work looks great. Or they can have no, they're in the opposite right? Their, their, their blood work looks crappy, but they're doing great. Am I saying the same? I keep I might have to be saying the same thing over and over again, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. So, so in cases like that, I would be definitely rechecking things and looking at um, immune modulation. And with lupus, um, you know, I know that Andrea, she hates me when every time I come <laughs> out there, but there's remedies called carcinosin. There's remedies that have, there's bowel nozzles. There's so many homeopathic remedies that address deep seated diseases like that, that don't cure them, but they look like they're cured. They look like they're, or they're just doing so, so, so well that you're just, 
blown away. You know, their lead, if they have stuff around their nose, their nose heals, or they have, if they have cracks in their lips, their lip starts to heal. Like, it's just, um, do they still have lupus? Yes. Are they doing amazing? Yes. But I would check their thyroid and then I would get a hold of a homeopath that can help navigate through their symptoms mm -hmm. and treat their symptoms accordingly to, to help to rebalance them. I, uh, I did Andrea dirty there and I put her link in the, in the chat. For everyone, so. <laughs> She's going to kill us. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Do you want one more, Julie, or, or should I don't, we... it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Let's do one more y'all. And okay. Hey, Julie, you said, I keep repeating myself. Keep, keep saying it. Cause we need to hear it. What? Whenever you repeat yourself, just just keep it. Oh, coming. Wow. you need to hear it. Yeah, I was, I was getting on this loop, going, "Am I saying it the right way?" Or am I? Keep it coming. We need it. Okay. Sorry, bear with me, y'all. Oh, here's an interesting one. Okay, last one. Can a probiotic? throw the gut balance off, even if it is a good bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's my overcultured canine article. Um, yes. And it's why we are adamant about the amount of strains that we use. So Phytos flora has got 16 strains compared to one or two. You know, you go and you bought and you purchase a probiotic that has lactobacillus in it or bifidus mm -hmm. in it or something. When you're overpopulating one specific strain or species, you can knock the rest of them out of balance. So it's important. It's important to give a diversity, give give the diversity of the different kinds of strains. Hundred percent diversity is everything, and still adding um still adding you know things that have even other diverse strains in them like fermented goat's milk or um uh kefir or you know fermented bone broth or whatever so that you're you're adding as many diverse uh um bacteria as possible but good question and yes you can you can you can overpopulate and knock knock it out of, knock the rest of them out of balance. Thanks, Julie. Hey, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight for the third and final webinar lecture from Julie. Other than, other than Wednesday for cats. <laughs> I think we've, so I think I started a, oh my gosh, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> Wednesday, we're taking a deep dive on Ask Julie Anything into cats, more specifically thyroid and kidney, Julie, am I right? Thyroid and kidney, yeah. Okay, so Wednesday, yeah, join us. Um, I sent the link for everyone to join us. If you were here tonight, I'm gonna bug you with an invite to ask Julie anything next week, uh, probably Monday. So thank you everyone so much for following us through this series, educating yourself and you know, joining us on the journey of doing better, better for your animals. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Thank you everybody, love you. Good night. Bye.